Hi, uh, welcome to the FinTech Times Presents series of webinars. Established in 2016, the FinTech Times is a global multimedia news outlet centered around the world's first leading FinTech newspaper. We report on the latest and brightest ideas from the FinTech world. Firstly, I'd like to say hello to our audience, which has come to us from all around the world, from uh, Asia, the Middle East, and from us here in Europe. Today, we're gonna to be asking uh, and discussing partnerships. Uh, the FinTech and Corporate Partnerships um, would really like you to follow the conversation using the hashtag FinTech Times Partnership and follow us at the FinTech Times. Companies of all sizes in the financial services industry must quickly adapt or risk becoming irrelevant. One of the keys to success, however, often lies beyond the actual companies themselves in an organization uh, evolving around partnerships. We've got a great group of people for today's discussion. And we're going to be discussing the best ways to form these partnerships, some of the success stories, and highlight best practice and obstacles that need to be overcome. So I'm going to invite them all to, to now join me on the screen. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to speak to each of them. What I'm going to ask them to do, first of all, is really just go around the table and give them a short introduction. Um, so maybe, Nihal, could you start by giving me a quick sort of 10 to 30 second introduction? My, my name is Nihala Bohatas. I'm a founding uh, board member of the MENA FinTech Association um, and a FinTech consultant for, in, in the region. Uh, I also help banks um, uh, go to market with their digital transformation projects. Uh, um, yeah, that's it. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Lovely. Thank you very much. And maybe next we'll go to, to Stephen. Perhaps give us a quick introduction of yourself. Sure, thanks, Mark. My name is Stephen Marshall. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Crown Agents Bank. We're a nearly 200-year-old British bank with a specialism in foreign exchange and payments into and across emerging and frontier markets. Fantastic. Welcome. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, Mashir, perhaps you could give us a, a quick intro. Ah, the classic mistake again. <laughs> uh, two out of four. Uh, Thank you for having me, Mark. Uh, I am a founder and managing director of FinStep Asia. We are a venture builder and innovation strategy consulting firm that helps companies go to market in Asia, uh, in particular fintechs. I'm also one of the co-founders uh, and board members of the Fintech Association of Hong Kong. Fantastic. Thank you all very much for, for joining us. Um, just to sort of start off, um, to, to sort of get our juices flowing, Nihal, I was going to ask you, what, what does the, the, the word and the term partnership mean to you? Right. Um, I mean, for me, partnership is really where um, two entities come together for, for and where they find a win-win to, to, to work together. It's really, really important that um, we've seen, um, while there's, there's tremendous advantages and benefits for, for, for companies to come together and partner, and in specific, we're talking fintechs and perhaps financial institutions, uh, poor, poor alignment in partnership can quickly lead to lackluster relationships and reduce the overall performance in, 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 in revenue and customer experience, which is the, really some of the objectives of why partnerships could, uh, um, uh, uh, can happen. So it really is uh, having a proper alignment and win-win uh, um, engagements for um, as 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 in, in terms of the partnerships when it comes to partnerships between fintechs and bank financial institutions. Okay, and Stephen, your your sort of take on the word partnership? I'd echo very much what, what Nihal said. I mean, finding a reciprocal relationship where you can benefit from one another's whether it's expertise or geographic reach or product offering to, to better service your own underlying clients. And yeah. I think partnerships in the past, certainly from a bank perspective, were seen as um, probably more competition than collaboration. Whereas I think now I mean, we are very much a boutique player and therefore you know, we're much smaller and more nimble than most. And therefore we look to that sort of collaborative spirit through partnership and, and reciprocity so so yeah very much echo that that sense of finding that win-win that works for for all parties okay and uh Michelle, your, your take on the word i can see this is going to be a running theme today 
<laughs> as Nihal and Steven have mentioned, right, uh, that there is a lot of synergetic uh, elements of two companies coming together, especially when you're looking at banks and fintechs. For me, it is uh, a matter now of uh, strategy, right? Uh, in When companies are uh, undergoing digital transformation in particular financial institutions, there's this whole question about build versus buy versus partner, right? And I think a lot of them are now going towards this partner ecosystem where they can use open APIs, have a core that is their own or on the cloud, and then the rest of it is basically microservices or fintechs that plug into their core. And I think that's where things are going to go forward. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so coming to you, Stephen, um, obviously recently um, you, yourselves have announced a partnership with MTFX. Could you give us a little bit of information about sort of why and uh, why, why that partnership was desired and, and sort of a little bit about how it was formed? Sure. So uh, going back to that earlier point about, you know, um, extending reach, whether through product or through geographies and, and MTFX have built a, a fantastic business servicing, you know, corporates, SMEs, NGOs um, to do provide global payments and, and foreign exchange and and we really saw the 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 benefit of partnering with MTFX because we can extend the reach into you know, some of the harder regions uh, globally so we we've historically specialized in Africa and the Caribbean but you know our, our reach is now going much further and you know, the African continent is one that is you know, fantastically exciting from a tech perspective and payment capabilities, but it's it still has its challenges. It still can be difficult to navigate, especially from a, a liquidity and, and finality of payment perspective. So being able to work with MTFX ex to extend to their clients the reach that we can provide uh, was just something that really seemed to resonate with the team at MTFX. And, and we just saw this as a chance to to really work collaboratively to, to spread further the financial inclusion aspect that's important to both MTFX and ourselves. Okay, it's interesting. <laughs> um, well, one question I was going to come on to now in a minute is sort of how's the best way to initiate these partnerships? But just before I do, yeah. Stephen, can you recall, was that more from your side speaking to MTFX or, or do you think that did they come to you? What, what, who, was, who moved first? Um, it, it was probably it was kind of a mutual understanding. I mean, we've, we're one of the few banks that really has a, a voracious appetite to deal with fintechs. You know, it's something that we've seen a lot of the banking sector shy away from. And we see that as a, as a huge opportunity to kind of step towards the sector. And it's, it's always about understanding risk. And it's just about what can you do to mitigate those risks. And in MTFX, we saw, you know, a client that was that had the same thought process. But how do you mitigate risk? And actually, once once we realised we're both on the same page about how we can extend reach safely into what are frankly some quite difficult and challenging markets, it, it was kind of a natural progressive step. To then say, actually, how do we do this together, and and can we make more collaboratively than than each individual part could do separately? So that that's what really drove it. So I think we came at it really at the same time. That said, it's something that we've been uh, really forging ahead with with a number of partners recently. So I mean, MTFX is one, but we've the partnerships also with people like Paycode and. You know, Vodacash, and you know, we've got a series of others that are coming up over the course of the, the not too distant future. So it's something we're really keen to embrace. And you know, fortunately, MTFX were in the same headspace as well. Excellent. Okay. So coming to you, Nihal, obviously a lot of experience in in, uh, in your sort of activities of connecting the two together. What are your thoughts on sort of the initiation sort of phase of these things? Um, very, very interesting um, uh, journeys I've seen there. Um, uh, first, I'd like to congratulate Stephen for 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 for, for getting there because uh, oftentimes um, with with banks, even though they've got the 
very much the intention to work with 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 fintechs, right? They've got the um, they announced this this their their intentions very clearly. Um, what really happens on the ground can can become very painful, right? Uh, we're we're talking about from finding the right fintechs to work with. Um, so the curation phase is is some so can sometimes become a challenge. Uh, um, then you've got the, the the procurement phase and then the integration, right? So what form of partnership do we go for? Is it going to be a a, a SaaS partnership form where where we, the, the fintech would uh, white label their solutions to the bank? Would it be a, a, a in a banking as a service format? Would it be a, a referral uh, partnership program or a co-branded joint program? So there's uh, which format best suits um, uh, uh, both entities and both both sides, uh, and 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 also, I mean, uh, being realistic, maneuvering the the walls of a financial institution, right? Do, who do we talk to first? Uh, is it business decision? Is it the IT decision? Uh, the compliance team then comes into play. Um, so it, 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 I mean, with with the with even though the right intentions can be there, and I see I see that a lot. Um, uh, the time it takes for those partnerships to see light can be a bit uh, hectic. So, um, and I think there's, uh, and I've seen uh, companies come in to help facilitate those partnerships uh, and help make them happen, right? So you have, uh, uh, obviously depending on the type of and format of the partnership, but we've got uh, API integrator, uh, aggregators coming in to, to, to help facilitate the banking as a service model uh we have um and, and that's and then there's uh, as the likes of fad in the us for example uh we and we, we're starting to see some of that happening in in the middle east and, and african and the MENA market um we've seen banks uh open, form their own api sandboxes inviting fintechs to come in uh do their in, in, in innovation uh, uh use their apis for 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 displaying innovation and then perhaps uh, some sort of partnership can come out of that. So the, the, the intention is there. There is there is action that's happening. There's a lot of traction that's going on. But I would say that we should try and find a way to um, uh, shorten the time period between those uh, action. I mean, to see those per partnerships actually happen and come to light. Uh, I think that would be a big, a big, a big part of it. Uh, a big part of the process that I would love to. Uh, to to see uh, uh, happen. Yeah, and I guess there's a lot of, um, as you say, that the time frames are quite different for both parties. When we're talking about absolutely partnerships with fintech partnerships, that there is a different sort of timeline that works on that. Maybe coming to Mashir, maybe you can obviously with FinTech Asia, you, you've done a lot of partnerships and negotiations. What sort of your exp experience of that sort of time difference between the two entities? I think that's that's the key, right? Uh, as Nihal mentioned, sometimes this can be the earliest or soonest I've seen is somebody committing to a six to eight week period, while in general, it's a six to nine month process. This is after all the decisions have been made and you have a go from the multiple departments, right? So the first element I feel is finding the right people that cuts down that time in immensely. Having said that, I think the onus lies largely on the financial institution. Because uh, one, there is the element of culture and willingness. Uh, yeah. You may have one or two people in the team who are willing to do this, but how broadly is the senior management? What's the buy-in to actually do these partnerships? And what level of partnerships are we talking about? Are we talking about superficial partnerships that just sound nice and trendy? Or are we talking about something that's actually adding quite value to the business? And that's where business plays uh, a lot of importance. Secondly, I think regulators... Uh, have played a key role. And uh, here I'm referring to open banking as such, where uh, FCA started that process in, in UK and now it's spread across uh, the world where a lot of regulators are uh, building out regulations for open APIs and open banking in different forms. Now that actually compels the institutions to go ahead and do more partnerships. I think the onus definitely lies with the banks. Um, and if they are like Stephen, they're, they're quite keen on doing things and have a culture of actually realizing what they can do and what they can't do is, is, is important. Quite a few times, uh, there is this uh, element among uh, senior bankers or teams that why do we need to go and build a partnership? We can do everything on our own. And this is a fintech. Oh, it's no, a small okay. company, right? Right. So that attitude, a bit of 
you know, chip on the shoulder or ego that needs to go away. I'm not saying everybody's like that, but I feel there is still legacy of that. Um, and uh, in addition to that, banks need to change how they think about fintechs. I think too many times it's thought of as startups, young companies who may not have the solid weight. Uh, credit card uh, yeah. divisions have been partnering for ages, right? Uh, they find partners on a regular basis. That's one of the key elements of credit card divisions for banks to find partners so as to sell it. And this is where the banking division, the retail banking or the others have to realize that this is a model that could be very beneficial if you can find the right partners, even if there's a share of the revenue. So yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I can see Stephen uh, smirking a little bit there and I'm just going to say I'm going to be on the bank side for, for the purpose of this because I feel like they're <laughs> ganging up on you Stephen. <laughs> um, Stephen is one of the good good guys. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say that. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say Stephen obviously as, as we shared it, it's kind of a common sort of um, theme with a lot of fintechs yeah. that you know that the banks are the ones that have control all the the cards and are making all the plays what what are the you know what are the challenges do you think of of the banks enabling them to enable them to actually contact and speak to fintechs it's a good question and i think um there's two aspects to it one would be you know, banks aren't tech shops you know they're they're not they're not designed they're not full of engineering teams uh, who are who have got experience on building solutions themselves. Banks historically have taken a long time to roll out new product, and the they don't often have the in-house expertise that can face off against a fintech to really understand you know what, what's the value that's been offered by a potential partnership. And I think you can spend an inordinate amount of time just trying to understand what is it in reality that the FinTech offers. And then of course, if you go out to try and gauge, is this the right FinTech to work with? You then, you look, you look to the market and there will there'll be hundreds or thousands that can offer what looks like on the face of a very similar service. So yeah, yeah. It, it really makes the banks take a step back uh, and question, you know, is this the right path to go down? Um, I would say we were no different. Um, the, I suppose the, the difference for us is we, we acquired a fintech last year and that for us was a, quite a big conceptual step that really, first of all, cemented in our own minds that being the provider of choice for cross-border payments into emerging and frontier markets, that was going to be our strategic intent going forward. And the best way to do that isn't to rely upon the old fashioned bricks and mortar that banks have relied upon forever. It was to say, we're going to do this differently. We're going to be tech led. We're going to be expansive in our geographic reach we're equally going to be expansive in our channel reach so you know banks historically use swift but we're going to look to ach and local payment rails and uh, mobile settlements and the only way to do that is either build it yourself over the course of the next thousand years or find the right fintechs to work with so once we've made that mental shift we then realized it was a great opportunity because we, we engage a lot with central banks across the world. And the central banks invariably are quite nervous about fintechs as well. Now, they love what fintechs do for the diaspora. They love that it makes it more cost effective and timely to send money back home to mum and dad. And they love that it gives more, more available cash in the hands of their population. So that's fantastic. But they are nervous about perceived lack of control around KYC, AML and CFT. But of course, as a bank, you know, the central banks look at us as being um, very rigorous when it comes to those controls, especially a bank based in the UK. We're seen as being, you know, operating in a sort of gold standard environment. So we're able to combine that that sort of savvy tech approach that a fintech has by partnering with the right fintechs, 
The fact that we acquired a fintech last year gives us that sort of in-house expertise, that engineering team, so we can have a sensible conversation. And then we can go to market, to, to new geographies and say, but we've got all this technology, we've got all this reach, but equally we're still compliance-led, which appeases the, the central banks and allows them to heave a sigh of relief because they recognise that yeah. as payments flow into their country, they don't need to be concerned about perceived lack of control. So um, it, it's a very different approach, I think, from most banks. But, you know, as I say, we are a boutique operation, so we are, we are probably a bit different from the norm. Yeah. If I may just quickly add here, uh, uh, Mark, and I think Stephen mentioned three very important points from a compliance and central bank perspective. There's a fourth, which is cybersecurity, right? Yeah. Uh, now in Hong Kong, the HKMA has come out with the open banking initiatives and open APIs, and it's left to the banks and the fintechs to determine what should be the levels of you know, engagement, compliance, cybersecurity, and agreements, unlike in the UK where the FCA approves the fintechs and then you know, the banks open up their data to them. So uh, if there is a breach of data or there is a hack of any sort, right, any failure, uh, say from the fintech side, the ones that are likely to be most impacted are the banks, right? So I think that's quite an important element for fintechs to know. Uh, in the previous version, I don't think we were really being uh, fully uh, fair to the banks, but we were talking about the owners being from the banks, but the fintechs also need to be prepared. They can't just walk in and say, we have this cool solution without you know, having that right compliance uh, set up with them, without uh, being able to showcase how robust they are. Right? I think that's an important element of being prepared to know who your customer is you're dealing with. Because if it was as simple as that about, you know, if you forget regulatory concerns, then anybody could have had uh, banking licenses and which is not the case. So yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point. We actually had a question in from Manisha asking, is compliance the big factor in whilst you look to department people? Now, on that sort of same sort of thing, obviously there's there's an onus from the fintech uh, to, to be compliant, et cetera. And as we said, that gives a lot of regionality to to how they can partner. You know, if a, if a fintech is based in the US and wants to partner with someone in Asia, there's a whole different compliance or regulatory sort of thing to, to sort of bridge. What's your sort of thoughts about them, those sort of partnerships? Um, definitely. I mean, uh, depending obviously on, on, on the type of fintech we're, we're talking about, because some, some fintechs come in as, as B2B efficiency gains for the bank. Uh, so they may not necessarily uh, need to go through that massive compliance process where, where, where consumer pr data protection, uh, uh, I mean, fintechs that are looking mainly to, 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 to finance or, or deal with the, with the, with the, with the recipients of financial services per se, the, these are the ones that are more likely to have to go through a, a massive compliance, um, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, due diligence, if, if I may call that. But um, and but also this is why a lot of it is led by the banks. A lot of the conversations are led by the banks. May the, the fintechs may have a great idea, a great value add, a great um, may satisfy a specific uh, business problem, uh, or uh, are very much in line with the strategic direction for the bank to um, uh, uh, target a specific new target segments that the banks wants to wants to uh, to um, uh, to attract. Uh, however, it's it's uh, they're more likely to look at the bank's compliance teams to say whether this is going to work or not. There's a lot of, as 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 Mushir had said, they need to come prepared. They need to have done some sort of research on what would work in different jurisdictions and what wouldn't. But um, so many times, uh, the 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 whole uh, uh, the compliance teams and at the banks, as 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 it may seem, they may uh, shut down certain projects, but also they may uh, 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 encourage others. Um, uh, but the fintechs will always be will have to always go through the compliance teams at banks. That's for sure. To for for these partnerships to actually flourish and 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 happen. Uh, but it's the banks' compliance teams that's usually uh, um, uh, when it comes to compliance. It's it's the bank that actually says what what will fly and what won't. Normally, it's sort of like the banks are like the gatekeeper, effectively yeah. for for compliance. Yes. And okay. as, as Stephen yeah. mentioned before. The, the onus from central banks is is on them as the the, the main financial institution to 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 yeah. be doing their due diligence and their compliance. 
and that and that's why it becomes uh, they they either uh, um, they that's why it's really important when I, when I when I'm talking to some of the fintechs that want to approach the banks I say always bring in uh, always tackle uh, bring in someone from compliance a, a, a buy-in from compliance from the very beginning because um, it, it might be great that you're talking to the business teams they're really happy with what you have to provide uh, when it comes to to the IT uh, teams um, they they may have a uh, you, you may have to look at the infrastructure, whether this is can actually work, they've got the right APIs in place, et cetera, but the compliance is a big factor that needs to also sign off on those projects. So, so it's, it's t really talking to everyone within the bank to make sure that um, you speed up your, 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 your proposition within the, within the bank. I guess, as we were just saying, the as we said earlier, the the emphasis is in the fintech world has always been, well, the bank needs to do better, the bank needs to do more of this, the bank needs to do that. Actually, I think there's a little bit of responsibility that the fintechs need to take on themselves to say yeah. we actually need to be more, uh, you know, structured in our approaches, you know, opposed to what Stephen said earlier. There's just so many fintechs over there. If you're not actually um, portraying exactly what you do and this distinct benefit which sets you apart, then that, that onus is, is, has got to be on yourself, really. Right, and uh, to add to that, to add to that, oftentimes I've also seen that the fintechs may approach a bank with an idea that they think the bank may want, but the bank is really somewhere else. They don't do enough due diligence on the where the bank is. What what are the the next steps of the bank's plan to take? Are they um, uh, are they interested in? Uh, do they have the right APIs in place or not? Are they interested to tackle specific segments or not? Are they so, so a lot, oftentimes the, the the fintechs would just want to open the door, have a conversation, but the bank may be, for example, in a position where they're um, uh, revamping their core banking. So the, the project here is the main focus for the bank is to is to to work out their 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 infrastructure for the time being. They may not be looking at necessarily uh, burdening themselves with with other integration projects that they may seem for the time being as something that's not a priority. And, 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 the, bank, and, and the FinTech will spend so much time trying to position their value for the bank, whereas the bank is really not necessarily looking for this specific um, uh, uh, solution to partner up with. Uh, so the, I think there's a lot of due diligence that the FinTechs have to do before approaching the banks uh, to be able to be in line with the bank's strategic direction as well. Okay, interesting. We're having a few questions coming in. So I was going to maybe put this first one to, to Stephen, actually, that's coming in saying, what would you say the biggest benefit of partnerships is? Um, I think it's about scalability. So if I think, you know, our geographic slant in, in recent years has been Africa and the Caribbean, but we... You know, we absolutely want to extend our payment and foreign exchange reach into into Asia Pac and into LATAM. And these are geographies that we just don't know as well. So we don't understand the landscape as well. Um, we don't understand the the settlement systems, the regulatory hurdles, the you know, who are the most appropriate players. And of course we can get our head around that. It just takes time. And it's in terms of a speed to market, it's often better to find a partner that you can work with on a reciprocal basis, extend your reach into geographic territories that they know best. Um, and that allows you to build, you know, volume and value through your own your own client base. And you know, we've got a client base that you know, really wants to focus on emerging markets. And we were providing some of them, but not all of them. And actually, so we've got a really trusted set of clients that view us as being a, a, an extraordinary credible player in the markets that we choose to operate in. So we can extend that reach. So I think, I think that a speed to market and your ability to you know quite rapidly expand both product suites and geographic coverage for me that's the real driver behind partnerships and what and why i think it works so well okay that's interesting Mathieu, do you want to sort of come in on that and, and maybe think about what it is from the fintech side of things 
what is what well, I was just going to tell Steven that uh, you know if he's looking to figure out what's happening in APAC uh, Nihal and I are uh, profit <laughs> partners for that right I'm, I'm doing a bit of uh, self promotion here or selling myself but I, I mean that's actually a reality of it all is that quite a few times I'm quite surprised about both fintechs and large corporates um not taking use of resources like fintech associations right uh, fintech yeah. associations yeah. are meant to help other companies come in you know help out with all of this frameworks blah 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 and then you have these investment groups in each uh, jurisdiction like invest hong kong in, uh, in in here in hong kong who does a similar role of helping companies when they want to establish and building that partnership and i feel that is something that people don't look at because it sometimes is just available uh, but i would implore steven and others also to do that now from a fintech perspective uh, it, uh, the value lies in again scale right for the fintech it's all about the scale that's number one if you're a b2b fintech you want more partnerships because then you can showcase that your product is robust you have you can go to more clients and i would suggest that fintechs sometimes can be like oh, we going only do it at the big bank you know they they very choosy and picky about whom they want to partner with but the reality of it all is when i am reviewing b2b fintechs and i'm like what is your clientele and if you don't have too many uh, banks and i'm like yeah no not going to happen uh, because the big banks need you to have a track record right unless you have some very strong technology you had use machine learning ai you know something or, or blockchain for that matter only then will they see you because you're innovative enough otherwise you need to track record so i think that's an important element for fintechs to uh, realize but the key uh, element that banks bring to them is scale banks also have a deep network that people forget and largely um as much as i'm sold on fintech's impact on uh, daily life uh, inertia for moving from banks is very high and as you move up the value chain right on wealth management and premier such as uh, crown uh, the lesser the movements are people don't jump right there are a lot of relationship the years of things i haven't changed my salary bank account for 15 years i mean i have the same one that i started off in india and here in hong kong i'm using one for the last 6 years right so in that perspective i think bank accounts can be very sticky and uh, irrespective of how the future holds uh, fintechs need to be aware of that to leverage off that uh, network they have an existing customer base that banks already have i guess now it's it's kind of as we were saying earlier it's very much uh, if that's the sort of the desirability from the 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 uh, the incumbent or the bank is obviously a faster distribution into a new region and for the fintech it's about as having as many banks as their customers as possible you've got that one to many sort of relationship which i guess is is causing the 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 the, the sort of the the delay if you like in people being able to form partnerships because there's too many on one side and not enough on the other side um yes absolutely and i i just think that um to iterate on on what you're just saying and what to share what you're saying um there are having having said that i think that there are a lot of um uh ecosystem players that have come in to facilitate the the, the relationships right and um, uh we're talking about uh, fintech associations we're talking about uh uh sand, sand, <clears throat> sandboxes uh, be regulatory sandboxes or 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 even bank driven uh, sandboxes um uh, we've got uh, uh i mean in terms of the mina fintech association for example we have uh, uh uh relationships with about 46 plus fintech associations across the world where where and we have the relationship with the regulators here in the region different jurisdictions we've got relationships with the financial institutions letting us know the type of fintechs that they or solutions or the problem areas that they would be looking to 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 solve and so we as as the fintech association we bring all parties together to 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 be able to take those financial services and op- those opportunities forward and 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 make and and be able to see some of those partnerships actually happen uh, um, and and so there there are there are there are uh, bodies that have emerged uh, you know to, to to be able to um facilitate these relationships going forward now with with uh, with with what we're seeing as well here in the region just to iterate the different models i think uh may perhaps open banking hasn't yet kicked in uh we do have one jurisdiction in the mina region that has made it official uh, as is properly has regulated have regulated open banking the rest are still at a, a place where there it's, it's either going to be market driven or 
regulatory driven that's still in you know it's still in a place that's not clear uh, however regulators are coming up with some frameworks to try and regulate a framework um, uh, to to facilitate uh, open banking uh, and see some of those partnerships happen because fintechs do need data fintechs particularly fintechs who are dealing with with customers or smes need the need data from the banks to be able to 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 provide for the customers they need to create accounts they need they need to uh to go on with the lending services uh they they need to to tap into and 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 and, and all of that if, if the if the bank holds on to the data um and does not have a you know um uh, does not have a plan to open this up because they may not want to lose control perhaps that's you know and, and, if, and if there's no regulation that that tells them that they need to do that uh then then fintech's growth are going to always be capped right to, to a certain degree or they would have to resolve to other means such as uh, I would say screen scraping or reverse engineering etc which 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 may also put the the customer data at risk so I think it's there's there's there are for different forms of partnerships that we can see happen quite quickly. I think perhaps the most most viable form here is the white labeled form. Banking as a service or open banking has not yet taken shape, uh, exactly taken shape. But there's also the um, uh, uh, there's a model where the banking as a platform model has evolved a little bit more faster than the banking as a service. So these are the different partnership models that we're seeing happen in in, in the region, or where, really where we are, or where we're at at the moment. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that you mention uh, data because we had another question in uh, saying, do banks trust fintech firms with their data? <laughs> well, then, Monsieur, Steven? do you want to sort of mention anything on that? <laughs> I think Stephen will be a better place to answer. This, but, <laughs> well, that was the uh, obvious yes. route to go, but the, I thought I'd start with you first. No. I think it's a very big no with, with multiple caveats on top of that. Uh, probably the data agreement between a bank and a fintech is going to run into a few dozen pages. Uh, that's that's what, that's what I would expect. Uh, I, I think simply no. I mean, look, we talk about data, not just with fintechs. You talk about large tech firms and data has not been safe with them. So, uh, and data has not been safe with banks themselves. That's a whole different story altogether. But uh, I, I don't think banks really trust uh uh, fintechs with their data and that's where the regulators are coming in to uh, open that up so yeah yeah do you want to comment on that Stephen or do you want to <laughs> I'd, I'd echo that but I, I don't think it's unique to fintechs I just think you know a lot of banks just not very trusting and that 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 comes from a good place though it comes from we tend to operate in a, in a you know, banking is the world's most regulated industry and and there are there are ramifications for getting it wrong. And yeah. one of the challenges we face is, you know, even in the, the most developed of markets, there's an explosion of fintechs. It's very hard for regulators to keep up. And they just don't have the bandwidth in order to ensure that the many of the fintechs in their, in their ecosystem are are, are held to account and are operating at the highest standard. So I, I speak with central banks regularly, and that is often what troubles them the most, is there are, there are clearly gaps in the supervisory controls. So in which case, if there, are, if there are gaps in supervisory controls, then a bank can't just rely upon the fact that a fintech is regulated. Because what does that really mean? And it doesn't mean they're held to the same standards as the bank is, even if they're regulated in the same jurisdiction and even by the same regulators. So we have to, we have to do our own due diligence yeah. and can't just rely upon regulatory status. So I think that creates, that creates the delays that you know, have been spoken about. So, and it creates that air of mistrust but I think it comes from a good place of ensuring that that you know the bank's data is safe, our clients' data is safe, and that the financial services ecosystem collectively remains safe. And if that takes a bit more due diligence, I think that's probably okay in the eyes of the regulator. Right. Well, if I may just quickly add this, this idea that struck me, and I, I'm not aware of myself. 
maybe it's time for somebody to come up with a data custodian model right uh, for years we've had the custodian model for transfer of funds and banks uh, and uh, you know central banks prefer that you saw that happening in crypto until they were custodians the central bank i mean the securities regulators were all about like we we we're going to be very wary about institutions going to get into it i don't know how that's going to work will it be an amazon will it be you know aws uh, could be the cloud providers providing that uh, data uh, custody custody in some spe spe specifications maybe that could be the way to go uh, or 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 some other way uh, like a you know a, a independent body that does that but that could be a model uh, for the future because data has been the new oil for the last 20 years and now it actually is uh, directly related to uh, revenue and money so that's probably one thing we may see in the future yeah and i think it's a really interesting sort of subject the other interesting thing that i was thinking as you're sort of speaking is that you, you uh, and we sort of touched on what you were saying michelle is like the the tech fins the interesting thing about sort of innovation in the technology space is the phrase um move fast and break things in the in the financial industry if i have five thousand pounds in my bank account i don't really want my bank breaking things no. and losing my money yeah. so there's a fundamental opposition when it comes to sort of innovation in the two industries i don't know if they know how if you want to give us some sort of thoughts on on what your thoughts are of that sort of blend between the two is that the fundamental reason why fintech and banks have struggle sometimes um i think i mean we're, we're seeing examples every day where the blend is actually happening um with, um, I mean, I read, I read recently Amazon, for example, launched the Amex cards uh, for, for, for their customers, right? And, and, and so they, um, the, the tech fins, it really is, the tech fins want to, want to be able to offer some sort of financial services, right? Um, and if, if the banks, I think it's in the benefit for the, for the banks to be at the back end of that, uh, use the Amazon channel for uh, their distribution of financial services. That's the model that I think will will, will be will, will be will be great to see. Amazon's got um, uh, uh, the banks will sit at the back end, become manufacturers of, of financial products, uh, yeah. and and provide some of that to uh, some of uh, use the Amazon as a channel as a distribution channel for those financial products. And and that's that's I think uh, the the route that's 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 happening. It's not necessarily to say that there's direct competition. But it's it's more of uh, of 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 roles or roles that each one would play. Uh, Amazon is best at distribution. They don't necessarily have the license or the regulatory or the compliance uh, uh, with, uh, that sits with the banks, nor the the know how to to come up with financial products. These are being crafted and supplied by the banks through the Amazon as Amazons of the world of the tech fins to 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 provide to their customers. Um, the banks benefit by by increasing, by obviously having an extra channel to sell of their services, um, uh, and Amazon has better ex customer experience because they will still hold that relationship with their customers. Um, so this is this is I think I think this model will will emerge uh, 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 sooner than we think. Uh, it's it is uh, every day we're seeing partnerships happen of 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 the sorts, uh, be it banks using the fintechs or tech fins as distribution channels for their products. Um, the Amazon Amex example, then you've got the Venmo and uh, they just launched the credit card with Synchrony Bank, uh, their Visa credit card with Synchrony Bank in the US. So this is, it's just that we, once you see the, um, the common grounds and, and, and a common strategic direction on both ends, uh, I think we will be seeing a lot of those of those happening in the near future. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that that probably in itself is probably a whole webinar conversation. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> um, what I was going to do is because we're, we're running right to the end of time now, I was just really going to ask each panelist to, to give sort of some final thoughts uh, in the sort of summing up, um, you know, thoughts about partnership and maybe what partnerships will look like into the future. Uh, and maybe I was going to ask Mishir to, to go first on that one. I think I'm going to build on the, the, the tech fin story, right? Uh, for those who are not aware, there's a, a bank, virtual bank in Hong Kong called Jongan, right? They are uh, effectively from the Jongan insurance uh, set up from mainland China, millions of tens of millions of customers, if not into hundreds of millions. And they were formed by a collaboration between Pingan, one of China's largest insurers and largely, I mean, completely digital, 
Secondly, Alibaba and Tencent, right? Uh, now that model is getting replicated in the Hong Kong virtual banking landscape where uh, out of the eight, uh, mod, uh, eight uh, virtual banks, we have some very interesting collaborations, including Standard Chartered with uh, BCCW and Hong Kong Telecom and uh, CTRIP. On the other hand, Bank of China collaborating with JD.com and uh, Jardines, which is a conglomerate. The most interesting one for me is ICBC, one of the world's largest banks, with Tencent, one of the world's largest technology firms, and New World and Hong Kong Exchange. So the models are evolving, as, as Nihal rightly said, that people are now, uh, banks may become the pipes of the future, a bit like how telcos went from providing you know, mobile phone calls to data, right? And that's where they make the money now. And I think that's going to be the, the same foil for uh, bank partnerships going forward. What I do see changing is the culture and attitude from top down has changed. Um, COVID's had a big impact on everybody realizing that digital transformation is not for tomorrow, but for yesterday, right? And everybody is accepting that that needs to change uh, internally. And for that, as Stephen mentioned, a lot of this is not going to happen internally. So you'll have to partner to build your tech out. You'll have to partner to build your services out. And that's just a reality. And uh, rather than trying to find the best partner, they'll have to find the partner who fits the bill. And uh, it may not be the best technology, but maybe something that uh, complies with the regulations and offers them a solid, robust path forward. That's where I see going. Lovely. Thank, Thank you very much. And Stephen, maybe your sort of final thoughts. Uh, I'd echo Mashir. I think culture is, is the way forward and that there's more alignment now between the, the aspirations of banks and fintechs. And COVID has, has just sped that along. I mean, digitization of payments as a prime example, we're seeing a migration away from cash remittances to electronic remittances um, during COVID. And at that journey was already happening, but COVID is, is, has sped that along. So I, w w once banks recognize that this is the inexorable truth, that we're moving in that direction, and that scale and reach is important, fintechs become the natural partners. I think we'll also see a consolidation. You know, if you're not expanding at scale, then the question is, what are you doing? So partnerships become the natural way to, to, to grow and expand. So I think an increasing pace of partnerships and more cultural alignment between, you know, the classic financial institutions and then the, the fintechs is, is very likely. Excellent. Thanks very much. And, and last but not least, now your final thoughts. Um, I just, uh, my, my final thoughts on this are fintechs um, will, uh, will, will continue to hustle <laughs> for, for the right partnerships uh, and uh, because it is, it is really a hustle. I, I would say, I mean, finding the right, I mean, finding, finding the right value proposition for banks to respond to them is, is, is something that's really, really key and important. Finding that common ground with the banks that they're approaching uh, for, for those partnerships is, 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 is key. Uh, uh, assessing the, the bank's readiness to, 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 to speak with them, be it uh, culturally speaking or technologically uh, or uh, infrastructure-wise, uh, technical uh, um, uh, readiness uh, for that matter. And then there's the, the part that they need to explore, which is the compliance aspect. I think if, if they check, tick all three boxes, then they're most likely to, to be able to get the, the partnership that they're seeking. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I'd like to, to thank the audience for, for attending and providing some, some really interesting questions. The, the theme of partnerships is going to run on the FinTech Times for the whole of this month and obviously for eternity as well. So it'd be really great for, for the audience to continue the conversation uh, on Twitter and LinkedIn. Follow us at the FinTech Times and use the hashtag FinTech Times Partnerships. Um, and then finally, I'd love to say thank you very much to all of my panelists. You've been amazing. Very much uh, thankful for you giving up your time to participate in this uh, in this webinar with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Well